Hello and welcome to Talking Tang, a podcast series where we will discuss Tang Dynasty of Classical China. My name is Daisy. I'm the host of the show today, and with me to discuss all about Tang is my good friend Joy. Hello. Each episode, we will talk about one aspect of Tang Dynasty, from the monarchs to art and to the many wars. Today, we will be talking about one emperor who's got quite a bad name. Zetian was the first and last female emperor to ever rule in China. She held the throne from year 690 to 705, but she held power way before then. Some modern historians have named her one of the best emperors in China, but many oppose this vehemently, describing her in quite vile terms. She was recorded in history as a ruthless monarch. A cruel woman with no regard to the correct way of life, and someone who favored evil sycophants and destroyed good and loyal officials. Before we get into why this is, let's first look at her rise to power. So Wu Zetian was born to a chancellor in the court and was brought up with very high education, the way a man of wealth would be. She learned to read and write poetry, to play music, and to speak very coherently. These were not things a woman was usually exposed to at the time. But I do want to point out that Tang Dynasty was actually the most liberal of all dynasties when it comes to women's rights. We see figurines from the Tang Dynasty of women riding on horses, and we know that they were allowed to travel and even hunt. This was due to the nomadic background of the emperors.、Mm-hmm. We'll discuss this in later episodes as well. Right. So back to Zetian. Her upbringing definitely has prepared her for being an emperor. That's right. When Wu Zetian was thirteen, she was brought into the court as a fifth-year concubine of the then emperor Taizong. He's the second emperor of the Tang Dynasty. As a concubine, her job essentially was to do the royal laundry. Then one day, when she and Taizong were alone, she talked to him about the history, and that impressed him so much that she was promoted to be his secretary, where she was involved with the state affairs. This could be when she developed her wanting of power and a political career. Then she also met the prince Li Zhi, who will become the future emperor Gaozong, and they started this affair that lasted until Taizong died. And here comes one of the many scandals of her life. Wu Zetian was supposed to be sent to a temple to be a nun after the emperor Taizong died, but Gaozong actually took her back to be his concubine, and she was named as Gaozong's first concubine, the second rank in the harem after his wife Lady Wang, who was the empress. That's right, and this was very scandalous and considered as incestuous. Since Wu Zetian was regarded as Gaozong's mother, even though not by blood, then in another scandal, Wu Zetian got rid of Lady Wang and Gaozong's former first concubine, Lady Xiao, the one he replaced her with. What happened was that Wu Zetian's newborn child perished, and she accused Lady Wang of killing her. Now, Wang's family was very powerful in the court since her uncle was a chancellor, but they couldn't do anything because Lady Wang was the last person seen with the baby. Then Wu Zetian accuses Lady Wang, her mother, and Lady Xiao of practicing witchcraft, which promptly led to the exile and banishment of the three ladies and Lady Wang's uncle. Now, this story is contested by many historians. Firstly, we are actually not sure whether Wu Zetian really gave birth to the child or not, because the timelines are very murky between her two sons and this daughter. Secondly, if there was a child, it isn't clear who killed the child. But most historians of that time agreed that it was Wu Zetian who did it and used it to gain power. And this is one of the instances where prejudices of historians were shown. Exactly, it was Lady Wang's word against Wu Zetian's, and the historians took Lady Wang's word. Was Wang a more trustworthy person? No one could tell. Yet they claimed that Wu Zetian did it because they wanted to portray her as a monster. Now that does not mean Lady Wang and Lady Xiao were all that innocent. The drama between concubines was often very complicated. And we will definitely talk about her portrayal later in the episode when we will have plenty of time to 
basically rant about misogynistic historians. Eleven years later, Goldson suffered from a series of illnesses. He had a stroke and was also the victim of a failing eyesight. And Zetian essentially was the head of the state. She made all the decisions, including waging war on Korea and effectively reducing it to a vassal state. Then when Gaozong died in 683, Wu Zetian's firstborn son, Zhong Zong, replaced him. However, as her son did not heed to her orders and her daughter-in-law tried to broaden her sphere of influence, Wu Zetian banished him and his wife in the name of treason. And after she got rid of Zhong Zong, Wu Zetian let her second child, Rui Zong, be the emperor, but forced him to abdicate in 690 when she declared herself the emperor. She also changed the dynasty name from Tang to Zhou. I want to point out that the term empress is strictly used in reference to an emperor's wife. So when Wu Zetian declared herself the ruler of Zhou, she was called the emperor. And she was a great emperor. She made the agriculture system better by building irrigation systems, redistributing land, and distributing farming manuals. And this is very important because the well-being of the civilians is very important to the well-being of a country. Uprises start when the emperor is not taking care of his constituents. And it was attended very well in terms of keeping her civilians fed. She had more than 800 huge granaries and at the height of her reign, she stored about 6,000 tons of grains in there for emergency usage. That could keep the whole of Tang fed for two years. And in order to store all that grains, she really advanced technology in terms of storing grains and keeping moisture out of the granaries. The Tang Dynasty under Wu Zetian was very wealthy. Wu Zetian was a big fan of diplomacy, and we see murals of ambassadors from all over the world visiting Chang'an, the capital of Tang Dynasty China. That's right. There were ambassadors from Greece, Sri Lanka, the nomadic tribes, and there exist many gifts that they have brought over. Another thing is that ambassadors from Greece and from Europe in general wouldn't have made it over without the Silk Road. The Silk Road was actually previously closed due to an epidemic and Wu Zetian opened it up and consequently revived trade with other countries. As a result, there were many travelers and foreigners in China, especially Chang'an, which was a very cosmopolitan city at the time. She also had officials who were performing badly fired, or in some cases executed and appointed better people, regardless of family status and connections. Some of this she did in retaliation or spite, but it nevertheless improved the system. It sure got rid of some nepotism that was ambiguous in the court. She also improved the military by making all the officers take exams and rooted out the unqualified ones. Wu Zetian also had military outposts along the borders and trade routes, and she closely monitored all signs of invasion and uprising. And finally, she established a method to obtain information from the people of her empire. She created a petition box that allowed regular citizens to criticize, accuse, and report things and also to recommend themselves. Before, citizens had to go through the bureaucracy to do it, but Wu Zetian eliminated all of that. This made her closer to the people. Which is something a lot of emperors had failed to do. Definitely. She also improved the taxation system and the public education system. In fact, she was a staunch supporter and promoter of literature, Buddhism, and Taoism. That's actually another point of interest for me. Wu Zetian actually used Buddhism to get people to like her. And she was trying to spread the message that, you know, I'm just one of you. And this is quite ironic since she isn't what you would call an exemplar Buddhist. Right, she has killed and tortured a lot of people, Lady Wang and Lady Xiao, for example. But she did build structures like Le Shan Giant Buddha and Le Shan Da Fu in Sichuan, which you guys should definitely go check out. It is absolutely magnificent. She also built the Great Wild Goose Pagoda in worship of Buddhism, and it was the tallest building to exist at the time in the whole world. But quite a lot of people didn't like her despite these efforts, did they? No, they didn't, and they had a lot of stuff to go on about disliking her. For example, soon after her inauguration, an earthquake happened. People went crazy. They took it as a bad omen. 
the scholar and Henry Rothschild put it this way. The message was clear. A woman in a position of paramount power was an abomination and an aberration of nature and human order. One Confucian scholar wrote that nature had been reversed by the usurping woman and throughout the empire and every prefecture hence turned into roosters or half changed. Why did he say so when it wasn't clear such a thing happened? It's because the scholars felt threatened by her. This is the she's against the correct way of life thing that we mentioned in the beginning of the episode. Wu Zetian was a woman. She had way too much power for a woman. It's a no-brainer that the male historians and scholars would be against her. So I guess this leads to our discussion. What do you think about her portrayal? Well, I don't think it's wrong to portray her as someone who is xin hen shou la, which is a Chinese term that means cruel and cold-hearted. However, we must admit that she is also a good ruler, whether intentional or not. I guess we'll never know if she did the good things with the goal of improving society, or if she was just trying to hold on to power. I agree. I actually think that it makes sense the scholars and historians of that time would criticize her, because with the Confucian ideals of that time, all about the clear difference from the emperor and their subordinates, and she, when she used up the power, it's it's only natural in a Confucian society to criticize her, but she was definitely demonized more so than other usurpers due to her sex. So for a comparison, Wang Mang was a man in 2 BC Han Dynasty who used up the throne and messed up the country for a few years. There was a whole war after that, but he was criticized only as someone unloyal. That is not a tame accusation in Confucian China, but he was not demonized. Additionally, in the early Ming Dynasty, so in the 14th century, Zhu Li, the fourth son of the late emperor Zhu Yuanzhang, waged war on his nephew because he felt that he deserved the crown, and he killed many civilians who opposed him. However, historians were not harsh on him at all, and there are actually many flattering stories based on him. These two men were neither criticized nor demonized, but when a highly educated woman comes along, someone who actually made China a better place, in fact, a place considered to be the most affluent place in the world, she was demonized because she was everything against the ideals of that time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important to note that she, like other politicians and other rulers, got worse and worse as she got older. For example, during her old age, she gave a lot of power to the Zhang brothers, who are officials in her court and also her lovers. I would definitely say that she got less fair as she got older. But this is something that happens with a lot of people and is completely normal. So how exactly did Wu Zetian's reign end? During her reign, there has been a lot of question as who she would pass the throne to. Her nephews are part of the Wu family had hoped that she would change the name of the dynasty and pass it down to one of them. However, neither they nor their sons were very popular or capable of ruling. In 698, Zong Zong was called back from exile and made crown prince. In 699, the empress gradually fell into ill health. In 705, it has been said that some leading ministers and generals seized the palace to give power to Zong Zong. This also caused the dynasty name to change back to Tang. The empress retired to another palace and died the very winter. She was buried with Gao Zong and nothing was written on her tomb, leaving her to be the only ruler without her accomplishments written on her tomb in remembrance. researching about Wu Zetian, I watched quite a few documentaries, and one ended on the question, what would you write on her tomb? So I will ask you, the audience, the same question. What would you write on Wu Zetian's tomb? Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to check back for our next release, where we'll be talking about a very ambitious princess and her attempts to follow in Wu Zetian's footsteps. <laughs>